the ref stopped it, and I, I thought it was Hermes. I, I, I was still trying to fight, and it was a referee, and um, I got Jorge back. Alonso was a referee. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, and I get back into the stands with my wife, and um, the main event was coming on, and I'm like, oh my god, I got to fight, and she said, no, you, you've already fought, and I had no no idea that oh, I had fought. Shit. Yeah, I had no no clue that I'd fought, and. Uh, I was I was trying to beg with her that I, I had a fight still. She said, "No, you already fought." Every time we touch on one or another fighter and their achievements, we often just briefly talk about the other side of this sport. Even though it is very showing and essential, we rarely think of the price and risk that athletes have to go to to achieve recognition and fame. And today, we will talk about specific cases when the stakes happen to be too high. Please don't forget about the likes, comments with forwards, and subscribe to the channel. Number 1. Kimbo Slice We start our compilation with a story of one of the most famous MMA representatives. Even though Kevin Ferguson, widely known as Kimbo Slice, never positioned himself as a professional fighter, it did not stop him from breaking into a couple of the best leagues and delivering numerous flashy performances. Every fan of this sport remembers and knows that Kimbo became popular thanks to street fighting. The brutal clashes he put on in the backyards were getting millions of views and drew the attention of the fans. Over time, Slice transitioned to a professional sport. Thanks to the hype, he managed to reach the top and shine in the main octagon. Being on the show itself, you know, it's an honor, you know what I'm saying? Considering all that <laughs> Dana White was saying about me, it's all good though, you feel me? However, later it became evident that he wasn't meant to be a top fighter. He entered the cage with an intention to kill or be killed, and oftentimes it was the latter, which is indirectly indicated by his record. In 2010, he decided to take a break from the sport. Everyone began to figure that apart from the vibe of that vicious street life and big name, there was nothing else. But in 2015, at the age of 41, he decided to come back. Sure, to present Slice to the viewer as a dominant fighter, there had to be a respective opposition. So in July at Bellator 138, he beat an already washed veteran in Ken Shamrock. But it wasn't the top of the gimmicks that matchmakers had to resort to. In February of 2016, Kimbo was supposed to have another appearance in the octagon. This time, his opponent happened to be his childhood friend and also more of a street guy than a fighter in the face of Dafia Harris, nicknamed Dada 5000. What happened in the octagon is still considered to be one of the worst performances in MMA history. The fighters were clumsy and hulky. After the first round, they got completely exhausted. In other words, it was a mess. Of course, Slice won that fight, but it would ultimately be his last performance. On June the 7th of 2016, Kimbo suddenly passed away. There's no need to go into much detail, but it should be mentioned that Kimbo took steroids prior to the fight, and it was the reason for his demise. But the saddest thing about this whole story is acknowledging the fact that the fighter had to resort to all these things to stay relevant and provide for his family. There is a quote that speaks for itself. In spring, we found out what was helping him to keep going, and already in the summer, what price he paid for that. Number 2. Wilfred Benitez The story of this guy is very similar to other famous biographies of popular boxers, whose sports journey roots back to early childhood. The Puerto Rican committed to boxing from a very young age and gave it all of himself. For the most part, his destiny was predetermined before his birth, as his father, in the face of Benitez Sr., was also into this sport and was an active coach. By the age of 15, after more than 100 amateur fights, Wilfred Benitez began his professional career. A huge experience combined with discipline and full commitment would start to pay off rather quickly. During the next couple of years, he showed himself as a very ambitious and fast-evolving talent. Wilfred had his first title fight at 17, with 26 professional performances on his resume. His opponent was the Cuban veteran champion in the face of Antonio Cervantes, who held the belt for more than four years and had 10 successful defenses. 
Undoubtedly, the champion was the favourite in that bout and did not hesitate to take the fight. However, the 17-year-old guy did almost the impossible. He earned a sensational win via judges' decision and became the youngest champion of the world. And by the way, that record is yet to be broken. That moment marked the beginning of Benitez's reigning era in multiple weight classes. Sure, he had numerous title defenses and broke into this sport with stunning success. The last big wins happened during the time of the Panamanian boxing legend's rise, Roberto Duran. However, soon the boxer began to gradually decline. Frequent performances, giddy success, sometimes not the best dedication, attention and focus to a couple of the last opponents severely damaged Wilfred Benitez's health. The accumulative effect as it is. Every athlete that comes to any sport has to acknowledge that and consider potential consequences. At the very end of his professional career, the doctors diagnosed Benitez with post-traumatic encephalopathy. Because of the illness, Benitez would be bedridden, lose his ability to speak and move his limbs. The sport gave him everything and in the end took everything away. On top of that, he developed diabetes combined with a frequent memory loss and complete inability to take care of himself. Currently, the former boxer lives with his family in his home country of Puerto Rico. However, unfortunately, his condition is not looking to get any better. Number 3. Johnny Owen We had never seen Johnny Owen's fight, so here in the United States, we thought it was ludicrous. He didn't look like he even should work in an arena where boxing was. Sadly, many already forgot the story of this guy, and today we are here to remember him and that tragic accident that happened in his life. Johnny Owen was always a courageous, brave and persistent boxer. This ordinary guy from Wales was beloved by the fans from the very first fights, despite at a first glance unprepossessing appearance. He became the first Commonwealth champion from Wales. He was the champion of Europe and overall always put on a vivid show in the boxing ring. But one single fight changed everything. On September 19th of 1980, Johnny got a chance to fight for the WBC bantamweight title. He shared the ring with the future Hall of Famer in the face of Lupe Pintor. At that moment, the Mexican boxer was already widely known in the boxing community, and he happened to be one of the reasons for the tragedy on that fateful night. Like in the Welsh's previous fights, this one also had the same degree of spectacle and uncompromising war spirit. After eight rounds, Owen was winning that fight by points and had more than a convincing performance. However, in the ninth round, he got knocked down for the first time. From that moment on, Pintor began to gradually take over the initiative. He started to land more frequently with each round and stun his opponent with heavy shots. The tragic ending came with half a minute left in the twelfth round. Johnny Owen got caught with another deadly punch and collapsed. Everybody began to celebrate, make noise and discuss what happened. However, the Welsh boxer was still laying on the canvas until the medical personnel finally approached him and took him to the hospital on a stretcher. He had a surgery to remove a thrombus that developed in his brain, but even that wasn't enough to save the situation. Seven weeks later, Johnny Owen passed away in the hospital, not getting back into a conscious state. 22 years later, people placed a monument in his honour on his home soil in Wales. In his father's wish, the memorial's opening was run by his last opponent, Lupe Pintor. It was a very enlightening story that once again makes one think about the health and main postulates of life. Because there can't be anything more important than life. Johnny Owen was a warrior, and like a warrior, he left his life on the battlefield. Though post-mortem, he went down in history and by his example showed that health is a very fragile but irreplaceable thing that can be lost and never regained. It's not your fault that nobody blames you. Please don't cry, please. Nobody blames you. Honestly. We thank you for coming over. Nobody blames you. No one. Just an accident, pure and simple. Come on, come on. Number 4. Spencer Fisher and to finish our compilation today, 
we would like to remember the UFC star of the 2000s and one of the main fan favorites of the past era. Spencer Fisher is a fighter that though hasn't become the champion, still left his mark in the sport and gave hundreds of thousands of fans around the world many vivid emotions and flashy highlights with his performances. The story of this guy is notable because he suddenly disappeared from all the radars and nobody even remotely knew what happened to him. His disappearance in 2012 lasted for a long nine years until in 2021 he finally got in touch. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. From the very childhood, Fisher was interested in fighting and everything related to martial arts. He had a special passion towards the famous clan of Gracie and was always delighted to watch what these guys do to their opponents from their back. Over time, the guy moved to a bigger city and began to train side by side with his friends. However, despite his eagerness and open desire in achieving his dream of the UFC debut, it might have not come true. Only at 26 did the beginner fighter make things serious and started to compete on a professional level. In the next three years, Fisher had 15 fights, winning 14 of them, and presented himself to the viewers as a spectacular brawler who neglects defense and relies on his fast hands. Spencer acknowledged that it wouldn't be easy to break into the world's best league. He was willing to do whatever it takes, which is proved by his decision to move to the gym of Pat Militich, who was the welterweight champion at that time. To become part of the team, the fighter had to train in tough and almost military conditions with a very pronounced hazing. All members of the gym were always testing the newcomer's toughness and only the most persistent ones could join the pack. Spencer happened to be one of them. All of his friends decided to leave the gym due to systematic beatings and only Fisher found a strength within himself to endure all of that. Spartan-like workouts that callous the rising fighter soon paid off. The world's best league noticed the guy in 2005. During the next two years, he successfully broke into the promotion, earned his nickname The King and became a true fan favorite. But as we already figured, such commitment and ferocious staginess always lead to deplorable consequences. Unfortunately, Fisher was not an exception. Already back in the time of his frequent performances, the fighter suffered from severe headaches but did not pay proper attention to that. On top of that, the price of recognition was a fracture of both arms, tear of shoulder ligaments and retina, issues with the spine, but that was only the beginning of his suffering. The most damage was received by his brain. The starting point of the upcoming changes in Spencer's life happened to be his fight with Ermis Franca in 2007. In just two incomplete rounds, the Brazilian ran over Fischer with hammering shots against the cage and won via TKO. Even though Franca's attack did not have knockout power, they still inflicted a lot of damage. And the next day I had to come back to North Carolina, so I flew and at the airport I was I was concussed, but I didn't realize that, you know, I don't think I don't remember if I went to the hospital or not. But of course they gave me the 60 day suspension or whatever it was. But uh, I tried to walk a straight line in the airport and I couldn't. And uh, you know, the straight lines in there and I tried to do it. And uh, the last time that I, I actually tried on my own will to do something and I remember my balance was shot. And the next time that I tried to do that is when I realized uh, I had problems. Despite an evident harm to his health, he continued to compete losing every subsequent time in a faster and more devastating fashion. That kept on going up until the end of 2012. By that moment, Fisher was already planning to leave the sport. However, he wanted to do that on his terms and retire on a high note. Prior to the fight with Eves Edwards, the brain encephalography of Spencer showed a result highly deviant from the norm and he wasn't allowed to perform on the card. The diagnosis ultimately shocked the fighter. He was only 36 years old. A terrible disease turned him into a dead man walking. At first, Spencer fell into a depression and changed. The next quote is given by Fisher's wife. This news has put Spencer in the worst depressed state I have ever seen him in and brought a huge cloud over our whole family. To see his spirit broken from being told that the only thing he ever loved to do may not be possible anymore has broken my heart. He's just not the man he used to be 
and I know He is scared of how He's going to provide for us in the future. When it became clear that the king was not able to continue fighting, the UFC offered him two options. First is to move to Sacramento where Fisher could coach in their gym. And second is to work in the media. In other words, the fighter would become the company's representative with everything else that comes along. But the most important thing is that he had to follow the confidentiality and non-disclosure clause of his illness. Spencer agreed on the second option and during the next five years, he was funded by the company that sent his family $5,000 every month. But the disease did not go away, it only got worse. The problems with memory and speech became more frequent and in 2017, the organization stopped working with him and refused to fund his rehabilitation. Fisher's condition got worse by the year. He was recognized as a disabled and now his wife takes care of the family. Emily worked as a physiotherapist in the hospital and after a while, she opened a small martial arts gym where her husband could coach. Only in 2021, Fisher admitted that he wasn't disclosing his illness because he was afraid of the vengeance. UFC could erase his name and destroy his legacy, but the athlete figured that he has to warn young fighters that only take the first steps in this game, although he doesn't believe that his words would change anything and he already gave up on the hope for the miracle of healing. The thing that scares him the most is the future. Because when you're young, you're, you're thinking of the right now and uh, living in the moment and the money at the time. And, and uh, even though it wasn't great, you know, I got a lot of bonuses and got sponsors at the time and uh, I was living happy, you know, happily. And uh, then one day it always comes to an end regardless of what sport you're in but the uh, injuries I took for, from it, uh, just, I don't know. I don't know if it was worth it, you know? And now my message is to tell people that, hey, this is a possibility, this could happen to you. And it's very real and it's changed my life. There it is, guys. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you won't miss the new videos. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this one. And of course, leave your opinion on this video in the comments below. See you soon. I just uh, knew it was a do or die and, and it kept that in the back of my mind. I have a family to feed and uh, just that was all the motivation I needed to get out there.